Welcome to the Conspiracy of Love webinar. I'm Aftal Aziz coming to you from Los Angeles. I am joined uh, today with some special guests. We have Bobby Jones, my partner in Conspiracy of Love and Good as a New Cool in Brooklyn. Hello, Bobby. Hello, everyone. Also joining us from LA is Adam and Mick from Not Impossible Labs, who are here to talk about their amazing new project, Hunger Not Impossible. Hello, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, Kathy Davis, the CMO of Feeding America, has very kindly given us a little bit of time out of her insanely busy schedule. She's doing amazing things with Feeding America, uh, with food banks all around the country. And here's, here's, she's here to talk to us about what you can do to get involved and how brands can help. Hello, Kathy. Hi, Afdel. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And uh, finally, last but not least, we have Alex Lewis from Revolt in London, actually in Bath, joining us. Hey, Alex, how are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're going to kick off uh, a couple of housekeeping things. You can submit questions to all of the panelists if you use the Q&A button at the bottom there. Uh, Bobby will be collating them. And as we go throughout, we are going to be um, asking you to submit questions, which we'll try and answer. Um, we're going to have Alex for about 15 minutes talking about uh, an amazing report Revolt London put out. Then we're going to go to Kathy to talk about the amazing work Feeding America is doing. And then last but not least, Adam and Mick talking about Hunger Not Impossible. Each of those will be about 15 minutes. And then what we're going to do is uh, keep about 15 minutes at the end for a more in-depth Q&A from everybody else as well. Um, so um, you can also find uh, these webinars on www.conspiracyoflove.co. They'll be stored. Last week's is up there if you want to take a look. Um, and we'll do the same shortly after we finish. We will send somebody an email newsletter with a link um, where you can see the and also download all of the different presentations that might be seeing here today via Dropbox link as well. So um, let's kick off. Um, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. How's things in Bath and how's things in the UK? What's the mood like there? Uh, it's been a surreal week when, uh, you know, I, I, our lead has been put into um, intensive care. So I think that's diverted everyone's attention somewhat. Boris but, Johnson, um, but he's, coming, yeah. he's coming out of intensive care though, right? I had some good news. He's yes, yeah, yeah. Right. But I think, um, you know, if you, if you were to write the script of this, then you'd have the, the heir to the throne and the leader of the country both coming down with it within a, a week. Um, you'd have been laughed out of town. So it's, it's, I think everybody's just coming to terms with quite how surreal this is um, and uh, to say nothing of the impact that it's having on, on, on lots of people's lives. And Alex, Revolt was doing super interesting work in London in the purpose space. I, I really admire and respect the work you guys do. Can you talk a little bit about what Revolt is before we could jump into some of these learnings that you found? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're uh, um, effectively a purpose consultancy. Um, we, we'd sometimes call ourselves an activist agency. Um, the important thing for us is that uh, um, the, the action comes first, really. That's what we, ha we spend a lot of time um, helping brands to understand um, just how they can have a biggest positive impact on something. Um, and unless that's a, an issue which not many people know about, it's really just talking about that issue. So it's about understanding how they're, they're best placed to um, make a difference against it and then use their creativity, imagination, media budgets um, to invite people on board. Uh, to, to try and create impact against it. And you've done some really amazing work with Budweiser, Mars, folks like that. Those are your clients in the UK, right? And internationally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we work with Budweiser um, globally and do great stuff around uh, renewable electricity for a a ABI InBev. So um, we've created the first consumer mark for renewable electricity, which is on um, 41 million Budweisers e each day. Um, we had some really interesting activity around Earth Day planned for a few weeks' time, but it, you know it's just one of those things which is which is on pause. Um, but as as clients start to you know channel their purposeful attentions towards um, the, the, the crisis we find ourselves in. Yeah, well, perfect segue. Let's jump in. I saw this report last week and I immediately shared it with everybody I know because it was one of the smartest, most insightful ways to look at this. So let's turn it over to you so you can jump in and walk us through it. Great. I'll just share my screen. And now is it, just a quick check that the screen is shared. There's no nothing in the way of it. So there's some yep. strange. Looking good. Looking oh, good. good. 
Thank you. So, yes, as, as I said a moment ago, we're, we're from Revolve. We were lucky enough to work with some great clients, Mars, Budweiser, Adidas. Um, and what we, we try and do is, is really make sure action is at the heart of what those brands are doing, not just words and rhetoric. There really needs to be a, um, a sense of what they are uniquely placed to, to make a difference against and then invite their audience uh, into doing that. And that's why this um, crisis is such a sort of an, an interesting moment in time because um, there's a huge amount of thought leadership which has um, come to the fore in in the in recent weeks. But I think what we really need to see is a um, a similar wave of of, of action leadership. Um, you know, the, the, I'm going to talk about three different phases that we foresee this um, panning out over. Um, and and the reasons that's important is because there's a million things you can do, and we've seen um, many clients coming to us and jumping for, um, you know, straight in, which is fantastic because there's so much enthusiasm. Um, but it's equally uh, important to know where your best place to make a difference, and that comes down to what your your brand and your business actually does, and it also comes down to to where we are um, w w within these these three phases, which um, is what I'm going to take you through very briefly today. Um, I think it's probably also worth saying that before you do go external, uh, it's important that you don't disenfranchise anybody a little bit closer to home. Um, so do what you can to protect your own people first and foremost. Um, pay attention to your supply side and be clear, transparent in your communication. Um, people have got lots and lots of questions and I don't think anybody expects brands and businesses to have all of the answers, but they do expect uh, transparency and honesty uh, around that. There's a great um, poster that the Guardian have put out this week. This is actually an internal campaign. Some of the work we've been doing with clients hasn't actually gone to the outside world yet. It's been much more about making sure that, you know, organizations of 100,000 people plus feel as though um, they've got their back first and foremost before they go into the um, any sort of external communications. Um, but when they do, um, this is the, the, the first phase, what we've, we've called the respond phase. Um, if you're watching this from Europe or the US, this is very much where we, we sit today. Um, urgency remains acute um, and brands and businesses are really um, need to look at how they can serve society's most critical needs um, to augment and support what government can do, but recognize the fact that this isn't a, a crisis which um, the public um, services can, can tackle by themselves and there's huge um, opportunities for brands to step in and help um, some of the most vulnerable people with, with their needs. We've sort of simplified it right down and said there's, there's three ways in which we can respond. The first one is serving. Um, so most notably the front lines, these are your uh, health workers, medics, doctors, nurses, um, there's already been lots of great activity in, in, in that sense, which you'll have no doubt seen. Um, I think it's particularly powerful when you can align that with your purpose as a brand um, that might have existed before this. So um, Dove, got, um, not only are they doing the right action in terms of what they're donating through the parent company Unilever, but they've actually managed to deliver that through their brand idea as well. Courage is beautiful, you know, really looking at um, healthcare workers and what they're doing on the, on, on the front lines. Um, but then we've also got what we call the home front, which is, um, you know, the, the, the best support network and the backbone of the country uh, the people who are making sure that there is um, behind those group of professionals helping with the sort of front end of a medical crisis, that they're actually uh, addressing many of the other ripple effects of this, feeding people. Uh, making sure the backbone of our country is, is taken care of. As, um, uh, the, the image there is actually from a Sam's Club um, uh, advert, which is just about recognising the important role retailers play and putting um, food on, on our shelves. And interesting thing is that's the best um, tested advert from a wave of, um, of commercials that System One have looked at recently, which sort of tells you a lot about what people are, um, are being motivated by during this crisis. Second way we can respond is by um, repurposing. So, you know, m most businesses and brands have um, things that day in, day out, they've been selling to, to consumers, but they also have an ability to, to lean in and, and, and repurpose that um, against the real um, needs of, of what we face. I think that the interesting thing here that we, we found quite heartening is there's not been a sense of backing away if people are already in that space. So we've had fashion houses, sportswear brands, we've had tech companies, Apple, Nike, Prada, Mango, Zara, all come in to try to provide 
uh, face masks. They, they're not saying that you know one brand that owns that that feels like a real collective wartime spirit with people coming on board. It's the same with hand sanitizer. You've got everything from beer companies to um, high-end fashion um, houses um, making an, an effort. And then the final thing is is showing care, and I, I think um, this is really about um, you know thinking proactively about how we can best support every member um, of the community and particularly those who are disproportionately impacted. So we've heard there's been a lot of talk about how this is a, a, a disease which um, is, a, is a great leveler, you know, it affects everybody. And that might be true in, in a medical sense, but it's certainly not true in an economic sense or a societal sense. And there will be people who are, as of today, being disproportionately affected by this. Um, but in, in countries like the UK and the US, that might be um, minority groups, low-income families, informal economy workers. Um, what, as it, it expands, we're going to see even more uh, in high-risk countries. And it's going to be, um, as we, we're focusing on our issues close to home, there's a good chance that many of the, the countries that are disproportionately affected by it are, are sort of forgotten about. But in that sense, you know, it's, it's really heartening to see some of the ways brands are, are getting involved already. So um, reacting with, with things. Uh, the Budweiser example there is that about actually asking people to buy a drink for further down the line for pubs which you can't go into today or well, was a lovely example I like there which um, is a Danish hand sanitizer um, and what they did was they they sell the first bottle to you at, at basically four dollars and um, the second bottle you want to buy costs a hundred dollars so it's just getting to the heart of the fact that you know people can't bulk buy these things but there is a real need for those it doesn't cost them anything it just shows empathy and insight um, on the right hand side here, you know, you can actually make that more active. So in Australia, we've had $80 um, community boxes from Coles and, Wool and Woolworths. Uh, and again, there's just nice touches of ingenuity we've seen bubble to the fore here. So those boxes you can actually put in the regular postal system rather than having to rely on uh, D to C uh, infrastructure. And we've seen lots of uh, empathy shown towards um, people on the front line in, in the NHS and medical care workers with free coffees and, and things like that. The next phase, um, as this crisis continues, is going to see us um, move into uh, a place where we can really relieve uh, the, the new normal that we're in. Um, nobody knows when this will be exactly. We'll, we'll look a bit later on at this sort of how it relates to the curve. Um, but this is about trying to authentically provide um, relief to this, this new normal, helping people to deal with social distancing, uh, working from home, being that su support and utility to the fore. Um, and we think there's probably four ways in which we might be able to, to help in that regard. Um, the first one of those is, is to provide um, support with what we call healthy lockdown living. Um, so beyond those immediate needs of people who just, um, you know, need need food and need critical support there's people who are just at home trying to do the things that we've become accustomed to in our everyday lives uh, eating healthily doing exercise taking care of our minds um, and all of these require innovative creative solutions which which brands are well placed um, to, to deliver um, there's a great quote from a frenchman the other day i heard which is uh, we might come out of this better but we'll certainly come out of it fatter you know there's comfort food by, by its very nature uh, is is something that people are in, in, indulging in uh, we've seen um, sales go through the roof uh, for things like peloton um, but it doesn't have to be those it can be everyday influencers and brands who can um, take care of, of, of these sorts of solutions as well the next thing uh, in terms of relieving is is actually about um, togetherness um, and the fact that we are um, being clustered together in groups um, that we might not have spent as much uh, proximity to uh, and further apart from other people who we're more used to seeing on a, on a, on a regular basis. So we've seen some um, quite interesting examples about reimagining social occasions from brands al already. Uh, we've seen commercials done in this space from people like Jack Daniels. Um, but it's not just sort of mateship that's being threatened. Uh, dating apps are really interesting in this sense to, you know, trying to uh, recreate intimacy which would have uh, existed in, in the real world. And as I say, it's not just actually about um, pulling people together who, would, who have been forced apart. It's actually about how do we live together with people that suddenly we have to spend 24 hours a, a day with. The next thing is um, what, what living in, in quarantine, if, if effectively, the searches for, for boredom on the internet increased by um, over 600%. 
Um, and this is where there's huge scope for brands um, to, to, to play. Best brands have always um, added to, to culture um, and it's just about realigning that with having to do that from within the confines of our own, our own home. Um, parents are a really interesting opportunity. We've been working with a um, powdered milk brand, Aptamil, um, to, to sort of uh, just talk about how they, they deal with parents who have just come home, uh, who had a very different image of what they thought it would be like as a new parent in their home um, when, they, when they got pregnant um, nine months ago. Mattel, Lego, Sesame Street have really dialed up their play credentials. Um, but it's not just kids' brands either. Um, Dyson, um, the engineering company, has set challenges, engineering challenges for kids at home. Um, and we've also seen a resurgence in, in clubs and just trying to pull interest groups together as we all um, look for things to, to, to fill this time. And then the final thing in terms of um, the, these sorts of relieving moments, if you like, is, is things that can be rescued. Now, they can't be rescued directly, but they can be uh, reimagined. And that's why brands are... Uh, are really good. I think the first thing to say is um, there are certain occasions which might need reframing. Um, so this week it was interesting to look at what uh, T-Mobile have done. So normally going out there with um, sort of light-hearted, fun April Fool's pranks didn't feel appropriate. So they reframed the campaign. It was all about give thanks, not pranks. Uh, this week going around Easter, uh, there's, there's interesting things then. And the sports events is, is another place where we're starting to see um, imagination applied um, when you can't play against soccer stars in, in this in packed stadium can we take that into the realm of esports and can we do it for a good cause as um, Gareth Bale um, was doing earlier this week and then the final phase um, is what we've called the rebuild phase and this is where we're was sort of emerging out of this slightly shell-shocked um, and I think that the um, you know, one thing I've heard banded around is the first thing people want to do when they get out of this mess is, is try as hard as possible to erase it from their memories and, and return to, to life as normal. Um, but it feels very unlikely that we'll be able to return to normal life as, as, as we might have known it. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean to say um, but it, it, it does have to be a, a very negative space that we emerge out and in, in into. There's obviously going to be very practical implications of this that we need to deal with. Um, but there's an author called Rebecca Solnit who says, um, we can't welcome disaster, but we can value the responses. And I think that um, our hope from this is that um, brands and businesses look at what they can actually do within the societies and the communities that they operate off the back of COVID and, and try to take that uh, into, into the wider world um, beyond just this, this medical emergency. So how can, um, I think most notably, um, rebuild the economy? Um, as I said, this, this is a, a medical emergency, um, but it, it, it's possible that that is even seen as, uh, as a relatively small thing um, when compared to the economic uh, emergency, which, which might well um, follow this. And in that sense, um, brands and businesses are obviously very well placed. That could be in a sort of quite uh, selfish manner in terms of some of the revenge spending that we've seen in markets like China and being um, in a position to take care of that. But it's also about actually having a, a much more purposeful role for our point of view uh, in terms of um, how we can um, rebuild and support the economy going forward long term. Also society. Um, so will we come out of this optimistic? Will we be seeking connection? Um, what about the thousands of people who've been directly affected? Um, how do we leverage all of the cancelled events that have um, fallen by the wayside in, in, in 2020? Um, but lots of questions that we should be looking into and thinking about um, as, as, as brands. And then finally, the environment. And I think that um, from our side, 2020 was always promised to be a really big year for climate change. Um, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day is, is, is weeks away, and I think it's going to be um, unfortunately, a, a rather somber affair this year, whereas it could have been um, something quite galvanising. We had the, the COP meeting in, in, in Scotland towards the end of the year, which has also been cancelled. Um, but also there's lots of talk about, you know, just looking at how purposeful we can be and how much change can be created um, when we really need to. So how might we apply some of the learnings of this crisis, that sense of um, purpose and momentum and, and, and focus and apply it to what is possibly a, you know, an even more um, pressing emergency going, going forward. So that's about it from our side. I think um, we just wanted to sort of leave you with you know, how to think about this 
it's a thinking framework more than anything else. It's not all the answers as I say it very much depends on what your brand and business is, is best placed to doing. Um, and you could probably think about these phases um, in conjunction with the sort of our infamous curve in terms of the number of the cases. Um, and this isn't about it being mutually exclusive either. You know, there are going to be ways in which we need to respond, not just in this first wave, but if so we're going to go on here, no doubt when it comes to hunger, that response is going to have to be um, long after the curve has, has started to flatten and, and, and go down. But I think the final thing I was going to say is just that um, many of the principles that we see that we need to adhere to today um, aren't just for the, the, the corona crisis. Um, much of the principles we, we would ask our clients to adhere to day in, day out are pertinent here, but they're just good principles of purposeful branding. So making sure that your action meets the words, thinking about the battles that your brand's really uh, well placed to win, small enough, we say, to win, but big enough to actually matter. Um, establish what you don't do is as important at this stage, I think, as what you actually do go out there and, and do. And um, fortunately, there's not been too many ish, um, examples of brands um, with making a faux pas, but when they have done, it's probably because it's something they should have just stepped away from. Uh, and finally, um, you know, get the cause, get the fight, understand where you're best placed to do it, but then it needs creativity. It needs something to brand that action so that it's going to inspire others um, to want to become a part of it as well. Um, and that, that was it for me. Um, thanks for your time. Thanks for the invitation. Um, there's lots to discuss. If anybody did want to um, discuss anything further, I'm, I'm always available um, and just wish you a very happy Easter weekend. Stay safe. Thank you, Alex. That's fantastic. Super cool, super interesting, insightful. Uh, we're going to make that report available to everybody to share later on. You can also visit revolts, uh, revoltlondon.com where you can download the report as well. Um, we're getting questions coming in from the Q&A. Keep them coming in as well. We're going to answer them in the last 15 minutes. Uh, if you have specifically any facts based on what you just heard, just uh, mention that and Bobby will take a look at that and kind of uh, figure out how to like uh, line them up when we get to the Q&A section. Um, if you're just joining us, this is the Conspiracy of Love, How Brands Can Help Fight COVID-19 webinar. This is the second week we're doing this. We try to bring together people who are on the front lines uh, of tackling the issues caused by this virus. And, and one of them who's been right in the epicenter is Kathy Davis, who's joining us from Feeding America. Hello, Kathy. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> well, I got to be honest and say I'm probably less busy than you are right now because you are in the eye of the storm. And I appreciate you coming and joining us for a few minutes to tell us about what's happening. Sure. I'm happy to. Let's, uh, so Kathy and I know each other from our previous careers as marketers. Kathy ran the media agency where I was, uh, where I worked very closely with. Um, and so I, I want to start, Kathy, by just helping people level set. Tell us about what Feeding America, uh, what the role, what the size of hunger was, say, 12 months ago, and what Feeding America does in terms of the food banks and things like that. Just the level sets so everybody yeah. understands. So Feeding America is a national organization that feeds um, close to 40 million people every year. And we have 200 food banks all around the United States who then distribute food through 60,000 points of distribution. So pantries, mobile pantries, sometimes they're in clinics. Um, and even before this crisis happened, there were 37 million people this year who were hungry in the United States which is pretty scary in and of itself. And now what's happening is in the last three weeks, as all of you know, there are an incremental 17 million people who've been laid off. So we're seeing huge spikes in demand. Um, not only are there, is there a massive increase in the number of people who are now looking for food, but it's, it's also kind of a perfect storm because supply chain distribution um, is not operating as normal. And so as a result of that, we don't necessarily have the same amount of donated food that we used to have. And at the same time, much of our organization was built on volunteers. We have over 2 million volunteers nationally all over America. Most of those volunteers or a good bit of them were 60 and above. And in order for them to be safe, it makes sense that they're not volunteering right now. And so we've looked at all different kinds of solutions 
um, including paying people. But at the end of the day, what it means is we have a $1.4 billion gap um, in terms of what it's going to take to feed people over the next six months. And let's just put this into perspective here. This has mm -hmm. happened because um, the depth and scale of what you're seeing is way beyond anything that you guys have ever projected or modeled for from a scenario perspective, right? So your estimates are uh, in the next, well, right now, as are we seeing in real time, employment, employment go from 3 million to 6.6 .6 million to 17 million in three weeks. That right. burden is to pass along in the food system. And you're projecting maybe that we now have, at least for now, 50 million people who up from the 37 million people who are food insecure and likely to stay that way for another 12 to 18 months, right? Well, hopefully they don't stay that way for another 12 to 18 months. But yeah. if you look at the um, if you look at the recession in 2008 and 2009, there were actually 50 million people in America who were hungry. So we expect similar kinds of numbers and there is a big gap right now, but people have been amazing. They've been companies, brands, individual donors have been incredibly generous and have really jumped in to help. And, and let's, let's talk about that because you've had this massive outpouring of generosity and support. Um, we'll talk about the brands in a second. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people saw the Jeff Bezos donation, you know, $100 million last Thursday. But I want you to tell people exactly how far that went, just so, again, they can get an idea of the scale of what's happening. So we've already distributed that money to each of the food banks around the United States. And it was incredible. It made a huge difference but this is a very big problem. So we are currently in the process of looking for brands that can help uh, large corporate donors and individuals, and they've been terrific. We've also had an incredible response from media companies. Um, we really have three objectives. We need to raise visibility of the issue of hunger and how extreme it is right now. And um, as a result, I think you've, you've seen a lot of that reflected on the news. We also need to drive donations to fill the gap. But then our third thing that we need to do is we need to let people know where to go for food at the end of the day, right? They need to be able to find it and they need to be able to find it easily. So those are our kind of core three objectives. So again, just to help everybody remember, if there's a funding gap of $1.4 billion over the next six months, 100 million is great, but that still leaves a lot of headroom. And that's where we're really encouraging you know, our friends in the brand community to get involved. Your CSR department may have already started this rolling. You're getting lots of two, three million dollar checks right now, which is fantastic, Kathy. But where we really want to see is brands step up and try and find ways to engage their consumers to create platforms where you can take all of that boredom of people sitting at home and channel it into helping people who are in desperate need of some help right now as well. Um, Kathy, I want to talk to you about what you're seeing on the ground in some of these food banks as well, just so people get, a, get an idea of the strain they're under. We talked about this, uh, I think, uh, a football stadium in San Diego, I think, that you had seen some drone footage of. Can you just describe to people what you're seeing at the moment? Sure. So naturally, people are concerned. Um, people who had jobs last week don't have jobs this week. And so what we're seeing is huge lines of people sometimes in stadium parking lots, sometimes stretching 800 or 1500 people long to try to get the food that they're gonna need for the next three, five, seven days. And so what we've been doing is we've been creating um, food boxes that contain Kathy. the meals that people need. And then people have been driving up and we're putting them in the trunk so that they can go home and um, we've helped to meet that need. And we've really restructured our whole distribution process to make sure that there's appropriate social distancing and that everybody is safe. Yeah, and, and also talk about the volunteers side of things. Again, you said the food banks were, were staffed by amazingly generous volunteers, but unfortunately a lot of them are older, so they're high risk. And also right now what's happening is that you need to have stability in terms of the number of hours that people can commit. So you guys are now actually hiring workers right now as well, right? To right, we've had, had quite a few food banks that do that. Because generally when you have volunteers, you might have 300 volunteers over the course of a week and they work one or two shifts. 
which is amazing and we love that they do that. But now when we're really trying to protect people's safety, we wanna make those numbers smaller. We wanna be able to have smaller groups of people. We're staggering um, the shifts that people have and trying to open that up as well so that they really aren't um, in contact with other people as much as possible. Thank you for sharing that. And then let's talk about the outpouring you've had from brands and celebrities. It's been kind of nutty, right? The last seven days. Yeah, it's well, the last two weeks, actually. It's been amazing. So um, we've had a huge, we have a, a lot of corporate partners at all times, right? We probably have a hundred corporate partners who provide food, funds, um, and, and visibility for us in a variety of ways. Um, we've had over a hundred celebrities come forward, everything from the kickoff with iHeartRadio and Fox where Elton John hosted um, an old fashioned telethon with Billie Eilish um, that helped us raise over $5 million in a single day to Disney's Day of Hope yesterday um, where all day long, people on the Disney Channel kicked off by Good Morning America, talked about Feeding America, our food banks, and the need to help. We've had custom creative and media donations from Chobani and Morgan Stanley and Green Giant and a huge number of brands. HelloFresh is putting our um, putting uh, inserts into 800,000 boxes around the United States. So we really have an incredible, we've had an incredible outpouring for brand, from brands and it's really helping raise awareness and donations. So we're very appreciative of that. Oh, sorry, Kathy, you, you uh, froze there for a second. Um, uh -oh. also, Kathy, <laughs> so if you had to give a, a message to this audience of people listening in who are people from um, made corporations, multinationals, people working in brands and marketing. What is that thing? How can we help you? So help us make hunger more visible. This is a massive issue. It's a massive issue globally. Um, and there are hunger organizations all over the world um, that you can help. And think about how it works from a brand standpoint, how strategically this makes sense for you. This is not just a problem in this crisis. This is a problem 12 months a year, every year, unfortunately. And so finding ways that you can raise the visibility of the issue. I thought that Alex, your presentation was amazing. Thank you for that. In terms of being able to give, give brands ideas about what they could do at various stages of this crisis. Um, and we're happy to work with any brands to help figure out from a custom standpoint how they can help. Cool, thank you, Kathy. You bet. Uh, and we've been seeing some amazing outpourings from, from the people in the committee. So thank you to all of you for, for jumping and helping. All right, uh, Kathy, we're, we're seeing lots of questions for you, by the way, so we can get ready to answer them in the last okay. section here. Uh, you can keep submitting them through the Q&A button at the bottom here. Uh, finally, last but not least, we're gonna turn to Mick and Adam from Not Impossible Labs. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. For those of you who don't know Not Impossible, can you give them a little bit of a uh, overview of what you do? Sure. Um, we are a group in Venice Beach, a bunch of makers and hackers and programmers and engineers are the way we look at the world is we look for things that we consider to be absurd problems that exist. And then we figure out how we can hack, make, modify, program, duct tape, zip tie solutions together that accomplish those uh, and achieve a solution to those absurdities. And then we try to make it accessible for everybody. Thank you, Mick. And, and one of the projects you've been working on for a while now is the idea of tackling hunger. Tell us a little bit about the Hunger Not Impossible project. And sure. Came about so, um, sure, so I'll, um, let me share my screen here. So, um, so hunger not impossible is something that we've been, can everyone see that? Just want to verify, thumbs up. Not yet, no, no, okay. Thumbs down. Oh, okay, now, thumbs up, all good, okay. yeah. Okay. Like a second. okay, so um, 
Hunger Not Impossible is something that we've been working on, as, as you said, FDF, for a couple of years now. Originally, we had looked at this as a solution that would achieve or start to address the absurdity around the food insecure. Um, some of the, the stats that Catherine talked a little bit about on this is that, you know, pre Pre COVID, you had 49 million Americans living in, in poverty and struggling with hunger, 30 million kids participating in free meal, free meal programs. Then coronavirus hits, and you've got an issue of 4 million restaurant workers are going to be potentially put out of, out of work, and food suppliers having a ridiculous amount of inventory that could go to waste. So, we originally started to do this just for the food insecure and addressing that problem, which is kind of a national uh, and international epidemic. And now with, with COVID, it's just kind of poured fuel on the fire. So we see the world through this lens of what's absurd and then how do we solve it? So for us, the fact that you had food insecure kids and families that are now more at risk and you've got a food insecure or, and you've got a food industry that's in crisis with, with staff and, uh, and restaurants closing, um, for us, we've always have seen the world through this lens of how do you make a frictionless solution where you're tapping into natural tendencies, natural behaviors, natural habits of people, and how do you use that so you can channel that towards doing good? And when you look right now at this problem that's having to be addressed around hunger, um, you're having this situation where you have a wonderful distributed and a diversified supply chain of restaurants that are scattered throughout communities where people can, they, they can act as hubs for people to go eat. And now that distributed supply chain is being slowly squeezed and squeezed and squeezed down to where you're going to create this, this forced mechanism of people having to descend upon individual places, which obviously doesn't work when you're talking about kind of a, a social distancing and, and trying to keep people spread out. So we just said, all right, well, we got to do something with that. So our, our purpose around this is we got to feed people, we got to feed kids and families, and we got to keep restaurants open. And so what we created was based on the statistic that 98% of this country has a cell phone, whether, whether you live in a tent on, in you know, downtown LA or whether you live in a mansion in Beverly Hills, everybody has a cell phone. So we created a hyper ridiculously simple text messaging platform that uh, is able to text people who need to be fed with prepaid to go order meals from local restaurants. And the way we did that is by partnering with Salesforce and Postmates so that we have this 800 pound gorilla of a CRM tool that has you know, all the bells and whistles of how we can deploy we tap into Postmates back end of having a, the, a tremendous amount of restaurants within the local communities. And that's how we collide the supply and demand. So the way that it works is step one is we give this application to, we're working with a lot of charities and organizations, foster care groups and boys and girls clubs. We give it to them. They input their phone numbers into of their of their members and it's on a HIPAA compliant platform so it's all secure they input their members their kids it could be 30 kids it could be 3,000 kids um, it sends them a, a simple text message the person enters their address which is a, a novel and unique way for us to get around the fact that most of the people that we were, were trying to address aren't on big fat data plans where they can sit there and, and stream Netflix on their, on their phone. They are on basic phones with basic plans that text and call. So we manually have them enter their address or cross street. That gives us the coordinates. We put a geofence around them and then make restaurant offerings and healthy food offerings in that geofence. They choose a healthy menu option because we curate them from the restaurants and, and the, the funny irony is that you actually can eat healthy at McDonald's and Taco Bell and Panera and Subway. You just have to have the, um, the self-control to do so. So we pre-curate the healthiest menu options so they can choose one of five menu options that are already pre-curated. The menu gets, the item gets paid for on the back end through Postmates. Um, and through the donors who are uh, crowdfunding to pay for the meals, the person goes in and picks up the meal and we're done. Uh, it's with a, it actually happens completely through five text messages. So in this situation, you see the, the person text hungry. So they pull the activation of the text. 
they enter their address, they choose a restaurant, they choose a meal, it confirms that they're told to go and do it, uh, go and pick up their meal. And the beautiful thing is now the charity, the school, the um, community-based organization, whomever, is able to fulfill their goal of actually feeding somebody, right? And actually doing it from their bedroom because all, once the phone numbers are put into the system, it's all automated from there. The restaurants are able to make a little bit of money to be able to keep themselves afloat and to be able to diversify the supply chain so that you can have it from multiple places. And the brilliance of this from, a, from a, an individual standpoint is that they get to walk in and they're not identified as Mick or Afdal, the homeless kid or the food insecure kid. We just walk in and grab the meal just like anybody else would have ordered. So there's a sense of dignity that that person maintains, which we, we think is really important. In um, choice, you know, I'll just add. In addition to, yeah, to dignity, add in addition to dignity being a really important design principle, I think choice is as well. Everybody deserves that kind of choice, and making sure that people are able to to make a, an informed choice from healthy menu items is a step forward in helping to improve the nutritional profile of our country. Right, Adam, you want to jump in on the dashboard? Sure. In addition to uh, all of the the, the seamless, simple. Uh, parts of the front end experience. There's a lot of complexity that's happening on the back end and everything is trackable uh, so that we can uh, make sure that program managers and program directors at the community organizations that are managing the population have the information that they need to uh, understand where their donors dollars are going, be hyper transparent with them about that, but also just as equally important, be able to manage that population with data and make decisions based on data. And so everything in the system is reportable. Um, we've got a really rich data uh, dashboard interface that our partners use um, that gives both cohort level information across the top. And as if this were live and you were scrolling down this page, you'd get down to individual uh, participant level data uh, in terms of who's eating what, when, how, um, and it's all, as Mick said, uh, built on a HIPAA secure environment so that it is uh, safe and, and can be shared with the appropriate stakeholders with the appropriate data preferences so that uh, personal information is not getting out uh, to people who it shouldn't. But that an individual who's responsible for managing a cohort of at-risk uh, individuals will know if Adam hasn't eaten in three days um, and can, can now reach back out to them through text messaging and actually have a, a positive feedback loop uh, with at-risk uh, uh, communities and populations. And we think that the ability for now a donor to you know, cut a check for $100, $1,000, you know, $50, and to be able to see down to the penny how the money has been deployed, and that, that is going to, I think, instill a lot of confidence in, in a world where donations are so important right now for people to know how my money is being used down to the penny. I think that instills a tremendous amount of confidence for the, and as Adam said, for the, for the organizations to be able to track and see exactly what's going on, to be able to respond and to predict and to be able to make choices and decisions on serving their population based on actual real time data, I think is really huge. So um, the, uh, this, uh, we, our initial pilot that we deployed in St. Louis, we fed about 11,000 meals in 90 days. You can see some of the meals in terms of the Subway, Taco Bell, Chipotle, Panera. So we see this as very much a market maker and being able to, to be able to go to restaurants and say, listen, we want to drive this business through your, your restaurants. The responses that we got from the, the kids that participated in this pilot program, um, which was pre-COVID, was that it, it actually just took away that ability for them to have to be stressed about what was going to happen for their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they could actually focus on the things about getting their lives together. So the things that we're all about right now is feeding the food insecure, empowering, augmenting, supporting incredible organizations that are, are doing this. How can, how can we help Feeding America? How can we help No Kid Hungry? How can we help the groups that are already doing this so that we can create this supply chain mechanism that makes it more efficient. There is a, this is a bunch of branding and advertising and marketers on this call. So everyone remembers probably the BAF commercial, we don't make paint, we make paint better. This is, we don't, we're, 
we're trying to make the organizations that have already committed their lives and their time and their resources to feeding people, how do we make them more efficient? How do we make it more transparent for the donor and for the general public to see what's going on? How do we keep the restaurants open? How do we control customer flow for the in-store pickup and make it so that we're actually doing things in a CDC compliant way? And then on the supply chain, how do you actually make it so that the, we're actually getting to things as Adam like to call it pre-waste? How do we actually get to food products before they actually turn into waste? So for us, we're, we're incredibly excited about this. One of the things as a, as a group of marketers or branders, we have had um, a tremendous outpouring of support from uh, athletes. Uh, Megan Rapino just posted on this the other day. And Clay Thompson is about to post on this and we've got a whole slew of different athletes around this. And I think the opportunities to, for brands to get on board and to support local communities, we're going to be um, hosting different things where, where people can actually um, in a positive way. And I think Alex, you talked about this in a positive way, compete to, uh, to advance the people donating meals. Cause it's not about, for us, it's not about money. It's about meals a way to advance that. There's a lot of opportunities, I think, for brands to get involved to advance that both on a national level and a local level. Cool. Thank you, Megan, Adam. And just for the record, you're actually doing this uh, now pilot in like five markets across the United States. Is that right? Which, kind, which cities are you in? Yeah, we are. We're, Adam, we're, help me out here. We're Oakland, Seattle, Los Angeles, Houston. Bo in Boston right now. Yeah. Boston right now. Okay, cool. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to flip it over to Bobby, who's been patiently collecting some of the questions coming in via the Q&A button at the bottom. You can keep submitting them. We've got another 15 minutes where we'd love to now go to the panelists and ask some questions. So Bobby, over to you. All right. Um, so yes, some really good questions. Um, I'll start off with uh, Mohan's question, um, which uh, can be directed to Alice or the whole panel. Um, how can we facilitate collaborative co-designing the future when we're officially rebuilding? Uh, we have a rare opportunity to reimagine systems like education, workforce development, and more. Um, so again, how can we facilitate collaborative co-designing the future as, as companies are actively rebuilding and trying to figure out uh, their own individual uh, futures as well? Is that directed at Alex, that question? Or is it yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have an answer as to how we can do it but exactly, but what I would say is I think there's perhaps more um, willingness to even imagine that to be possible. I think that um, a few weeks ago, the idea, uh, we, we were trying, in the UK, we've been trying to um, get a, a brand which is a, a basically a gut health brand to support the NHS a few months ago. And it was so complex to go the hoops that we had to go to to basically supporting the public sector. Um, and this week, I'm tripping over brands who are giving to the NHS, uh, so uh, which is our national health service. So the idea of where brands can be involved in public life, I think, has has, has shifted um, quite a lot over the past few weeks. And um, that that would be one thing. I think the other thing is um, uncommon collaboration we, we, we've seen. Um, so if you can if you can sort of tap into that willingness for brands to turn up in places which might have seemed um, surprising in the past, um, and and channel that into collaborations because it's necessary uh, at that sort of scale, then it might be um, a, a good starting point. But I, I think the, the other thing that you need is a um, a really clear brief, um, you know, for those brands to get involved. And there's there's something wonderfully simple about the the um, you know awful but simple the needs that we've had, which is social distancing, so you know, um, protective equipment. These things are relatively straightforward for brands to get on board with. As you get into some of the thornier, more complex issues that we face as society, it's it's incumbent upon somebody to simplify that right down, so brands actually know where they can channel their help. I would suggest. This is Kathy. I think that there's quite honestly never been a better time to disrupt and to reimagine the future. We have reimagined everything in the last month, our distribution channels, our supply chain. And I think so many brands are in the same place or will be in the same place. We've gone through a massive, massive change. And I think that brands, media companies, everybody's going to be impacted. 
And I think people are open to discussions to Alex's point that they would not have been open to a month ago. So I think we're only limited by our imagination and our creativity. Love it, I love it. Um, Kathy, the, uh, the next question uh, was directed to you, um, but I, I, from uh, previous discussion, I think Mickey Mouse might have some thoughts on this as well. Um, but are there any distribution, <laughs> and this question is from Valerie, are there any distribution channel, channels available for brands to manufacture lower cost alternatives, um, such as unbranded products or low cost packaging uh, that can be helpful? Um, and I think uh, I'll even add as, a, as an addition to that, um, Mickey spoke about the, the, the surplus of food um, that's the result of a lot of restaurants being closed as well. Um, and how can that also uh, be of, of service and of use uh, to, to initiatives that are focused on feeding uh, the hungry right now? Absolutely. So in terms of the food service piece, we're already seeing the food service industry start to work with retailers to try to help with distribution issues. Um, truck drivers were the first thing that happened there because so much of the food, um, so much of the food consumption is now coming from grocery stores versus versus restaurant channels, unfortunately. So that's changed fairly dramatically. And the real issue for us there is sizing. And so we're working with those partners to see how we can unlock that for individual families. In terms of other kinds of distribution channels, we are looking at all different kinds of alternatives with manufacturers. And if there is anybody on the phone that wants to do an unbranded alternative or lower cost packaging in order to be able to get food out more simply or more inexpensively, we would be so open to that. And I'm at cdavis at feedingamerica.org. So just send me an email. Um, you know, I think that in, in the, the question about um, supply chain, um, if you look right now at the number of restaurants that are closing and you look at kind of the habits and the patterns of how uh, Americans eat at quick serve restaurants, um, you're seeing right now uh, a dramatic, you, you know, one in seven people, right? 50 million Americans who would eat fast food every day. And you're seeing those restaurants close. We have the opportunity, if you think about the model of the sharing economy, when you think of empty car seats is how Uber and Lyft started, empty bedrooms is how Airbnb and VRBO started. You have the opportunity right now where you're looking at restaurants that are either tremendously down in terms of volume of production or they're on the brink of closure or closed. And so one of the things that we very much contemplated is looking at markets where we actually go in and pay restaurants to reopen and pay their employees and pay for their food product at cost so that they can diminish those food products and keep their employees paid for and be able to create distributed uh, sites where people can come in and pick up meals. So I think it's just a matter of just looking at where those opportunities, it's, it's hard to say it as an opportunity, but it's an opportunity to serve where you're looking at kind of the changes in the marketplace taking place. I don't know, Adam, you have anything to add? Yeah, and, and I think the idea that while 50 million people are, you know, typically eating at fast food restaurants, um, to going back to the original point, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be eating junk food. And I think that's a, a key part of our behavior change uh, opportunity, which is let's piggyback not only off of existing market dynamics, but piggyback off of existing behaviors to start uh, shifting the nutritional profile in a sustainable way. Love it. Thank you. Um, one uh, more question, uh, particularly for uh, Not Impossible team uh, from Pauline, um, who wanted to know what are the steps to connect a nonprofit, um, you know, with or are in at risk communities uh, to, to your platform? Uh, Maybe you, you spoke about this a little bit a while ago, but also as well, I think, as, as local restaurants. Um, they also want to be a part of uh, the solutions, the ones that are still open um, sure. and able to. Um, well, the, the thing that Adam and his team have built is, you know, with our partners at Salesforce and Postmates is we've built this, dare I say, infinitely scalable solution that it is just a question of inputting those phone numbers into the system. So any charity that wants to be part of it, 
all you really need is you need the, the kids or the families or the constituents who need to be fed connected to a funding source to pay for those meals. And once those are connected, then we're off to the races. It's, it's really not that complicated. Um, so in terms of, of uh, how nonprofits can be involved, they just need to, to reach out to us at hunger at nonimpossiblelabs.com. Um, you can go to our website. We're not hard to get in, get in touch with. We don't try to be too secretive. Um, and then the second part of your question, would, how could restaurants be involved? Restaurants are involved already if they're part of the Postmates network, if they're, if they're on Postmates. If they're not on Postmates, they can get on Postmates, and we're going to continue to expand that. So again, it always goes back to us. We try to make it so no one has to do anything unique and unusual. We just want people to go to restaurants. They're going to order food. And if there are restaurants around Postmates, which most of them already are, then we're not asking them to do anything unique or different. I love it. I love it. Um, so I think, um, I think we covered just about all of the questions. Um, and I think I can give one uh, from Mohan uh, about what, for Kathy, what does the food distribution supply chain for public schools look like oh, in the future? And has the federal government been engaged and asked for support through future stimulus packages? What's going on in the schools? Yeah. So, um, so luckily schools have been kept open in most communities and, and they're now giving kids to go meals so that they're not congregating in groups. Um, and we've been working in individual communities with schools on being able to do that. Sometimes it includes breakfast and lunch. Um, the only way to solve hunger is with government, corporations, and charitable activities. There's really no way to do it without that. It's a massive issue and we all have to work together and the government is a huge part of that. They, um, they actively give us federal commodities. They're a huge partner for us um, across a wide variety of programs. And um, it's a pretty complex system, but, but uh, it works. Yeah, great. Uh, and one quick question from Phil White is, do you, does Feeding America work with the World Food Program? We do, we work with anyone who wants to raise money or, or um, get food to yeah. adults, kids, families. We do a lot of work with the Global Food Network and the European um, Food Bank Federation. And we do do some things with the World Food Program as well, but we, we are happy to partner with anybody who shares a similar mission. Great. Phil, Phil White, reach out, join the dots. I know Phil does some work with the UN and the World Food Program as well. All right, um, that's it. We're at time. Thank you very much to all our panelists for joining us today. We had a very stimulating discussion. Um, thank you to everybody who, who came in with questions and answers. Next week, just to give you a bit of a preview of our topics, we're going to be talking about mental health. Uh, one is, which is another issue, I think, that is happening uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, we're going to have Andrew Moores, who is the CMO of Talkspace. It's a really fascinating platform for virtual counseling through text messaging and through uh, FaceTime. Um, he's going to be joining us. And from, Ad, from Edelman, Anne Earhart is joining us to talk about the fascinating Edelman Trust Barometer COVID-19 report. Uh, we referenced some of it last week, but uh, she's going to be joining us as well. So um, we're going to be sending a link out to everything here. Uh, via email. If you signed up by Eventbrite, you should get a link to this entire webinar plus all the supporting documentation. You can also find it on www.conspiracyoflove.co. Um, we'll sign off and uh, stay safe and stay sane and be well wherever you are, guys. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.